Um, so Rosemary Cashman is a nurse practitioner at BC Cancer in Vancouver. And she's worked with the brain tumor patients and families for over 20 years in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. She also serves on the board of directors at the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And she's an inspiration and, and humbled by the courage, resilience, and creativity of, passion, of patients and families that she has come to know. And I know personally that Rosie has touched so many lives. And um, she, the, the, the knowledge and her talents are woven throughout our organization. Um, and, and we're just so grateful. So without further ado, thank you, Rosie. We're going to continue using, yeah, we're going to actually use the mic because this session is being recorded, so it's just for the audio. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction, and thank you to Janet Finaki, uh, Nelson Pierce, and Joseph Tesorio, who have all, are all with us for our first panel session today. Um, I'd just like to start by asking you each to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. First, Joseph. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph DeSoro. I am the husband of Margaret Ng, who presented this morning. Uh, I am a caregiver. My wife was diagnosed with a grade 3 oligoastrocytoma back in 2013. And... Um, being a, a husband, a caregiver, a best friend, now a father to two children, uh, it's had its challenges that um, I'll be more than happy to, to share with you as we progress in our, in our session today. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Nelson Pyers, and uh, uh, I am, have the, I guess, unfortunate pleasure of um, having both my uh, wife touched with uh, an acoustic neuroma uh, back in 2003, so that type of brain tumor. And then uh, once again, we were touched, unfortunately, with my youngest girl uh, who had a uh, juvenile uh, pilocytic astrocytoma. So uh, we sort of had the double whammy and a few other things. So um, I'd be happy to share you know, any of my experiences and feelings and so on with you uh, in today's session. Hi everybody, my name is Janet Fanaki. I'm from Toronto. I am uh, the mother of two children and the reason I'm here today is I'm also the wife of a uh, wonderful husband who was diagnosed with glioblastoma just over two years ago in September and uh, fortunately though he's doing well and uh, has been clear with his scans for the last over a year now so we just hang on tight to those good news bits in our life. Okay. So just open the floor to your questions if anybody would like to ask anybody here. Do you have questions? Oh, you... Okay, I didn't. That's great. Does anybody have those? Because I'm. Okay, great. So I guess, you know, certainly one of the things that I see in my role is that a lot of attention is focused on the patient when you come to clinic. And I know, knowing the families that I do, that um, the energy in families is also focused on patients. How do you make time for yourself and how do you? you know, take care of yourself in order to continue the work that you do. I don't know if anybody in particular wants to take that. Yeah. Okay, good. Great, thank you. Great question, Rosemary. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I practice this answer. No, I'm joking. Uh, um, for, for myself, it was first, first and foremost the understanding of, of that philosophy, you can't help others until you help yourself. So that was fundamental for me. And um, in a nutshell, I, I have to block it in my schedule, the activities that I feel I need to do for my own self-care. And right now, having two children, 
and uh, a wife who is doing well from all her scans. Um, my schedule isn't as hectic as I'm sure as some others, but uh, I front load my day. So that does take a sacrifice. I wake up early. Exercise is important for me, um, as well as, let's say, meditation or reading. And uh, it may sound like cliche, but no, I, I, I block it in, and I do it early in the morning because I do know that if it's not blocked in or I don't do it on the front end, it, life happens, as they say, right? And then you, you start, as, as, as every day progresses, all of a sudden you've gone a few days, a week, a month without any self-care, and then that's where you start seeing the, the, the slide. That, that's what I feel. And by no means am I perfect, um, but that is a strategy. And I think my takeaway is, yeah, blocking it in. And you do have to have a strategy. Um, I, I think just sort of winging it that, yeah, I'll go to yoga or I'll, I'll talk with my friend whenever I have a chance, uh, given our new normal, uh, those chances and free time, if you ask me, they're far and few between. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've had an open discussion with my, with my wife, and it, it, again, it's, I think it's coming to that understanding, too, that uh, not only myself, but she needs time to herself and time for her own self-care. And I think that uh, coming to an understanding of what that looks like, I mean, I would love to take four or four hours and just do my thing. Obviously, that's not a reality. Um, but, um, you know, if we, we've come to uh, uh, an agreement that, you know, taking a few moments in the day, an hour or so, uh, would work well for both of us while the other one takes care of the kids, that's how we're able to do it. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, my new normal is maybe a little different. I, I don't want to get onto a pity session or anything like that, but just so you understand what sort of our life has been. And some of you may have touched on some of this or not. Um, started off with, you know, my wife with her, uh, back in 2003 with her uh, acoustic neuroma. So she had, uh, this was also during the time of SARS. If everybody remembers that, where it was a very difficult time. So, you know, she had that tumor taken out. She lost her hearing on the right side and so on. And, you know, it, it took her about a year to recover from that. So, you know, and we were just a, she was my girlfriend at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, she had moved in with me. We lived together. I made sure that she had everything she needed. Uh, you know, bought her an Xbox so that she'd be, you know, had something to do all day because uh, we had a lot of fun, you know, killing stuff on screen. Uh, you know, getting all that frustration out at the time. So, you know, we, we did that. That was great. And then, you know, we got married. Uh, then we had our first child. And uh, unfortunately, with uh, my Jordan, she was born with a smaller than normal cerebellum, so she was born without any balance. You may have seen her around in her walker. Uh, that's my girl. And uh, so, you know, then my normal changed again with that, right? So uh, we adjusted, and that was an everyday difference with her. And then uh, in 2016, my youngest, uh, unfortunately, ended up with uh, her brain tumor. And uh, we were just thankful, actually, uh, Dr. Ranger, who was here today, uh, was the one that operated for 18 and a half hours on my girl and did not stop until that was gone. So she got it all. And she's been, uh, her scans have been very clear and clean for, for this time. So Angel, Dr. Ranger, that should be her name. And uh, so our, my normal's been sort of changing. And also in 2011, I had kidney cancer. So again, that was uh, another whammy on us. So my normal's been a little, little different than a lot of people's, I assume. Uh, but it's always been a change, right? And that's the big thing. And you have to just learn to adapt to change. Find out who you are. I have a lot of discussions with myself, right? And being the dad of the family, I always threw a lot of, of it on me, my shoulders. The guilt, you know, why is this happening to my family? I must have done something in my life, you know, that uh, warranted this. I don't understand it. So I shook my faith, all that sort of thing. And, uh, but, you know, I've always found that I was like my best audience and my worst audience. But at my best, I could sit down rationally, try and discuss it, say, you know, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but, you know, I think the most important thing was that I was able to make peace with it 
you're never going to like it, right? As a caregiver, it's hard, right? It sucks. Uh, you're always going to feel guilty. You wish there was something you could do. You're going to feel powerless, right? That's normal. That's, again, the new normal. But if you can rationalize the fact that I'm doing what I can, I'm here for them, I'm here to support them and look after them as best I can, and, you know, try and support myself a little bit, too. And with me, it was discussions, you know, uh, Joseph, right? Joseph had, you know, his little time that he could have, his exercises and so on. I get that. If I could bang out a, uh, you know, smack a, a heavy bag or something, I'd be pretty happy doing that. But with me, it was really learning who I was at the time and every day that I wake up, you know, who am I? And, you know, how do I deal with today? Just get through today, get through tomorrow. And, and, and off we go. So my new normal, I'll let you know when it's over. Uh, you know, hopefully it's done and everything is good now. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's just you do what you can. And with me, it was really just being able to talk to myself and just rationalize everything. And like I always say, you know, dads, they cry in the car, right, on the way to work. They don't cry at home. They don't cry in front of people. They do it on the commute. And I was fortunate enough at the time, living in Oakville, working in Mississauga, 20 minutes away, but it was an hour and a half drive, so I had a lot of time <laughs> in the car to deal with that. So that's, that was my, pretty much my normal at the time. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, I, I think one thing you have to do is, at least for me, I had to really give myself permission to sort of forgive myself, if that makes any sense, you know? Because I, I put everything on my shoulders, right? You know, being the dad, that's just how I was built. That's how I'm made. I, I want to look after right? my family, make sure nothing hurts them and whatever. So I really had to find the strength to forgive myself and say, look, it's... It's not your fault, even though you can say it all day that it is your fault. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything bad. I'm a good person. I've lived my life well, and I've never hurt anybody. So, but it's giving yourself that permission, you know, to sort of take that weight and sort of put it over there or throw it away. That can be a very hard thing. Because obviously, with the people that you love, you're so invested in that that you just want to take it away. Right? You want to reach in, take out that whatever is hurting them and, and you know, put it on yourself and take it, take it out and move it. Reality is, is that's not it. So really just be patient with yourself. Understand that it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be, you know, really, I mean really angry. Okay? Not, not the kind of angry where someone cuts you off, you know, and you're, you know. No, I mean really angry. And it's, you know, it could shake your faith. And that's okay, too. You know, questioning things in life is okay. And I had to find the strength to do that, to make sure that I was okay with myself and being all of those things that I had to be. You know, so I hope that helps a little bit anyway. So um, I would say when my husband was first diagnosed and for the first at least two, three weeks, it was all about him. And that was a conscious decision on my part. It wasn't going to be about what my needs were or, um, and bear in mind, we also had two children. And it was at a time when uh, my daughter was in grade 12. She was getting ready for applications to university. And it was September 1st, so she was, this was just at the front end of her embarking on that part of her life. And uh, my son was entering grade 9. So it was two big parts of their lives were about to begin. And uh, so then Adam got the diagnosis. I'm not going to get into all the, you know, how it presented itself because it's really not important to this part of the conversation. But, um, and we had two weeks from when he was diagnosed to when his surgery was going to take place to, at that point, try and take out the entire tumor. And so we spent those two weeks researching, 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 meeting any medical person that we knew. It didn't matter where you were on the totem pole in the system. Who did you know? Did you know an oncologist? Did you know somebody who worked at a cancer center? Did you know somebody of somebody? It didn't matter because we wanted to talk to that person 
and get our arsenal of education and information so that we could build a team around us that would lift us. So, and it was really important. I remember the moment that the, um, the doctor who became our surgeon, he was on round, so he was the one who delivered the bad news. I remember being in the hospital room with my husband and you know it was a shared room so unfortunately you know the man in the bed beside us and his wife were witness to all the drama it was like the best soap opera that they could have been watching and um, and I just looked at Adam and I just said that's okay we know what it is let's just deal with it let's just get our army around us and just deal with it and then it was interesting because the woman the wife had said what do you mean you're going to deal with it? That's your doctor, the one who came to see you. He's the one who's going to deal with it. And I said, well, we don't know that yet. You know, we're going to do our research and really make sure that we've got the right team. And the right team for us meant um, people who just would listen, right? And that carried through everything. It wasn't just for the surgery. It was everything. If you weren't somebody who was listening to what I was saying as far as like how I was feeling that day or how, you know, whatever was happening at that moment, you're just not the right person for me. So, and it didn't matter that I hate you as a friend or I don't want to ever spend time with you, but it's just you're not part of my inner circle of who I need. And so that was part of my self-compassion, just making sure that, um, not that it's always positivity, it's just partially, you know, somebody listening, right? And then the other part of it too was um, once you know he had the surgery and he was at home and he was resting and there were lots of hours spent watching TCM, those good old fashioned movies and lots of TV and walking the dog. And you know, then it became, uh, my physical came up around then with my own doctor. And so I remember being in the examination room and she said, so what's going on? She had no idea, right? Because I hadn't, you know, called into the office to say anything. And it was only, it was within the month, right? So, and I said, well, you know, Adam, he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, so it's a little bit of a shit show right now. And so she said, oh, okay, Janet, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that you're healthy. And that was a turning point again for me, just to make sure that I was aware that my health was just as paramount as his health was. And it wasn't being selfish, it was just like you were saying, Joseph, making sure that if you're not doing what's good for yourself, you're gonna be really of no use to anybody else. And that meant physical and mental. So, you know, once I was ready, you know, meeting with a therapist, because as a caregiver, you're absorbing everybody's pain. It's not just the person that you're living with. I mean, of course, they're the person that you're looking at every day. You're seeing the stitches, you're seeing the exhaustion, you're seeing the tears, everything, right? My kids were stoic. They're trying to hide from us how they're feeling. So trying to, again, as the caregiver, talk to me, tell me what's happening. You know, it's just, but again, you're absorbing, right? Learning to let go. So sometimes there were those walks with the dog where I have, and I'm famous, it could be a day like today, no sun. I've got my big black sunglasses on. It doesn't matter. This could be good days, bad days. But on the days where I was walking the dog, the tears were streaming because I hadn't seen a therapist at that point, you know, and God bless my mom. I mean, I love her. We talk about all kinds of things, gossip, you know, no frills, flyers, all that stuff. But they only have so much energy to listen because sometimes it circles back to how that person is feeling about what you're telling them. And in fairness, you're the caregiver. You need to have somebody who's listening to you. So if your cancer center or your physician or whoever, if you know a friend who knows of a therapist who's willing to take you on as a patient, go see them. It's so valuable. Don't be too proud. Don't fall back on, you know, well, you know, I'm Ukrainian and Ukrainians don't, you know, go talking to people because I've heard that a gazillion times. I'm Ukrainian. So I, I come from people who don't talk to people, you know, so I get it. But I made a conscious effort to not be that person because I just felt that I can't go home at the end of the day and still be absorbing everything. So God bless the therapists. They just sat there. I needed them to be my sponge. I needed them to just watch me ball 
because I needed that release. And that's what made me strong. So there were a variety of ways of doing self-compassion, but I really felt that those were a couple of the paramount ones for me. And I, I encourage everyone. Well, I mean, therapy, I think, is nothing to be ashamed of because we all live in times where with social media and pressures and stresses and traffic and work, what have you, you sometimes need a professional that's just going to listen and give you some really valuable advice. Sometimes it's maybe just even telling you to keep a journal. Because a journal can be really great at helping you fall asleep at night and just have a restful sleep because it gets all your thoughts out on paper that you're not storing in the back of your brain. Okay, um, I'll just, uh, I, I don't know if the, if, if the recording caught it, but the, the question is, uh, what was my experience when the time came that my wife and I would seriously consider having children and expanding our family? <clears throat> so my, my, my wife is a, a type A personality. She likes to try to take control of everything, um, including her husband sometimes. Yeah. Just, sometimes. I know, just kidding. Uh, back to back uh, back back to the seriousness of things. Uh, we did have a uh, we did have open dialogue when the conversation sorry when the diagnosis did come through, and definitely children and the ability of having kids definitely d came up as well. And what we decided uh, in, in summary is that uh, she would need to be in a physical and mental and emotional state to be, uh, sorry, she needed to be at that certain level where she felt that we can then uh, have that conversation. So for me, I, I come from a, a large family, uh, in, which includes relatives, aunts, uncles. I've always wanted a family, a large family, but I took a step back and I just let her do her and what I could do to help her get to whatever state and, and whatever health condition that she needed to be in uh, for herself and, 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 and obviously for, for us as, as a family. And give or take about two, three years later, uh, she felt that she had hit her milestones, whatever she had going on, and I was there to support her. And we had uh, a clear communication with our uh, team, Rosemary's on, on our team, and we were very open and vocal um, in, in sharing what our thoughts were during, uh, during this thought process, and, and, and just, it was just a matter of time. And then uh, when we got, when we spoke to all our healthcare professionals and all those people that we uh, really valued their, their input, um, and when we got the positive feedback back and got the thumbs up, that's when we decided to, to move forward with it. Um, in my situation, um, my wife, uh, Debbie, you know, we, we had thought that the whole brain tumor thing was behind us. So we really weren't too sort of analytical about the whole idea of having children. So we were, you know, we just jumped in and had, 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 a, had a girl. Um, and then, you know, once Jordan started to show the symptoms of her condition uh, with her, uh, you know, cerebellar atrophy, um, that's when we sort of had a bit of a discussion in terms of, are, are we going to do this again? You know, uh, and, you know, is, is, is our second child going to turn out, you know, the same? And, you know, because anyone that's had a, a child with, you know, physical disability knows it's quite a, a handful. It's, it's quite a handful. It's one thing, you know, you, you, you get to... Uh, you know, people don't appreciate the fact that, you know, you, you just drive into a mall and you park the car and your kids jump out and they follow you into the mall and off you go. That's not our reality, right? Our, and everything we do, every trip we take, you know, is everything accessible and so on. So we, we, our discussion really rotated around or, or sort of centered around, will we have a second one? And, uh, uh, you know, my wife, 
being full of, you know, the love that she has uh, for their children and so on, uh, really, the discussion was pretty short. Uh, we're we're going to do it, and, you know, what, whatever comes, comes. And we tried to prepare ourselves for the worst, and thank goodness that our, our second child was born, you, know, you would think, perfectly normal. And, you know, nothing happened until she was, you know, uh, older, a little older. But, um, uh, you know, <laughs> in our case, it was like, look, uh, we, we just, there's way too much love in our hearts that we're, you know, we're not going to have children, and we're just going to live with whatever comes. So we didn't analyze it too much. Let's put it that way. You know, it was just, this is the way we are. So boil down, it's basically how did you choose who was going to be your circle, right? Yeah. Um, I think it was something that was a bit of an evolution, really. I, I think, you know, well, I remember the way I shared it with everyone who wasn't in our immediate family. And it was through an email because we know a lot of people. So, I mean, other than, of course, our brothers and... Um, my mom and my dad and that, you know, so his parents are passed away now, but um, so it's through an email, so of course, you know, you start getting, you know, emails back, oh my god, I can't believe this, this is so shocking, da 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 da, and um, you know, there, there were some people who, right away, they would drop off hot meals at the house, you know, just drop them off on the porch, right, um, and you just think, wow, you know, they really get it, you know, like it wasn't about just dropping by, they want to see Adam, you know, they want to see, you know, and right, and, and people would peek in, like I remember I was literally like a bouncer, so I would open the door and somebody would be on the porch and it could be a really close friend, it could just be somebody who's sort of a friend and they would say, oh we brought something and they would kind of start motioning to step in and I'm like, yeah, and I would be blocking the door and they're like, well, can we, can we come in? Like, is Adam home? You know, and I'd say, yeah, no, he's upstairs resting. You know, and I thought, mm -mm -mm. you know, like it's just, there, there's, you, you know yourself, right? You know the signals that you get from people just on a day-to-day -day level on conversations, right? You know, the nosiness or the curiosity or whatever. We just felt like this isn't the time, right? And, but that's okay, you know, like as time went on, those same people, they've become part of the inner circle. It was just in the beginning, I had to learn that some people just don't know how to deal with this stuff. You know, they may know how to deal with something that's sort of bad news, but when it's really something, not everybody, first of all, knows glioblastoma. All they knew about glioblastoma at that time was about Gore Downey, and that, you know, everything that everybody knew about Gore Downey was basically like he was dying. So, and that was it. And so I had to wrap my head around that too. I'm like, oh, Gore Downey, you know, like, where's he at in his um, treatment? How's he doing? You know, so yeah, even though I knew nothing about him, I knew nobody who knew him. But yeah, so, you know, I got it, right? I mean, it, sometimes people said things and that, that may not have been appropriate at the time, but then it's okay. Later on down the road, it, it ended up being that, I, I, I began to appreciate them for whatever strengths they did have that they brought to the table. But then there are other people who just, yeah, like, for example, I was at a birthday party, I was representing, my husband didn't go, and, you know, a family member was there, and he had just had his surgery, and I guess for all intents and purposes, this person thought, he's fine. And she said, oh, so he's cured, he's good. And I'm like, 
And I'm a very honest person, so it's maybe not, you know, I've had to learn to sort of pull back a little bit, but not too much, because I still feel that you need to be honest. But I said, well, it's really not how that goes. You know, I mean, sure, the tumor's been taken out, but we've got a long road ahead of us, and the road will not end. This is not the kind of thing that it's finished after a year and then you can carry on for the rest of your life, right? This is going to be ongoing scans, ongoing stress, that, you know, every few months we could get bad news. So, I mean, you got to wrap your head around that. And she just looked at me like, well, you know, go to hell. Like, that's basically her face, you know? Like, and I just stood there strong, like, I'm sorry, and maybe that's not what you wanted to hear, but I feel like it's my duty to tell you because I don't want you going out of here telling people some misinformation. So, um, and, you know, maybe that still hasn't won me any favors with her, but it's, you know, again, she wouldn't be somebody I'd go to on a, you know, first basis to, you know, for support or what have you. So, yeah, I mean, other than, first of all, the medical community that we had around us was paramount to make sure that they were the right people, good listeners, um, really said, do you have any questions? You know, that, you know, those types of people. Um, but then, you know, friends and family. I mean, for Adam, he was just happy just to have people come by and just talk about work and talk about clients and because he wanted his normal, you know, I mean, who can blame him? I mean, doesn't that, isn't that what everybody wants? They just want their normal life, right? And, you know, whatever that looked like before this bad news came. So, you know, he had that and he wanted to make sure that I had what I needed. So if it was going out for drinks, you know, one night, you know, whenever, you know, going to play tennis, which I do twice a week with a fantastic group of 24 women, and they are my own, you know, little sports therapy people. So, yeah, you just, you learn as time goes on who those right people are and listen to your gut. I mean, that's really the bottom line. You know, if it's somebody who's just, just being too nosy, too curious to whatever, it's just, they're not in it for you. They're in it for themselves. That's what I learned. Um, in our case, um, our family was uh, not really around. Uh, we didn't have a big support group. My wife and I have always kind of just relied on each other uh, most of the time. So um, it's just the kind of family that unfortunately we were born into. Uh, a lot of the uh, cousins and so on and so forth just sort of weren't around and called and you know, do anything. Even my wife's parents were, you know, they made it look nice on social media, you know, to make it look nice for the, for the family that when they were watching, but they never really helped out much, you know. Uh, thank God my, my parents were quite good about it. My dad, even is in, in his advanced age, you know, before he passed, you know, would come cut the grass, you know, things like that without asking, you know, he'd show up and there he is cutting the grass and, you know, wouldn't even knock on the door knowing that, you know, you know, maybe uh, uh, Debbie was busy or, you know, my little Sammy was, was not feeling well or whatever, you know, even though, you know, Grandpa wants to get in there and, and see her all the time. And so, you know, up until he passed, he was, you know, it was great that way. But anyone that's really there and, and you know, as was mentioned, not there to be in your face is really appreciated, you know. Someone that's not there just for their own sake to make themselves feel better but are there to help you with little things. And it's the little things sometimes that you don't realize, you know, because life still goes on, right? Things have to be done. Dishes have to be washed. Uh, you know, your, your car has to have gas in it, and your grass has to be cut, and, you know, all these things that you kind of try and have to sometimes put aside. If you have family that comes and does that for you and does that without asking, wow, that's, that's fantastic. Or friends that do that for you, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, a, a lot of the others, I agree, more just for themselves. Um, unfortunately for Debbie, you know, her mom was very much the woe is me, you know, my daughter has brain tumor, oh, look at me, you know, whatever. I had no patience for that. Uh, so it was a little tougher for us, but, you know, we persevere. But if you do find someone that is there to do those things for you, yeah, latch on to that. That's wonderful. And thank them for it. That's one thing, too. If someone does something nice for you, make sure you thank them. Right? They need to understand that. And that, you know, it might be little to them, but it's, it could be huge to you. Yeah. 
So Brain Tumor Foundation is creating a caregiver handbook at this point, and I'm really interested to hear if there was one thing that you would want to see included in that handbook, like either a topic or suggestions or just something that would be of real value to you as a caregiver, what would that be? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is um, knowing that it's, it, it's okay to, uh, to feel selfish, to be, there for, uh, to be there for yourself as a caregiver, and to do what you need to do for your, for your family. And, you know, I know I, <laughs> I'm just thinking of like an action movie right now, being the hero, jumping off a, a building, you know, to save somebody. But, uh, but, but, but really, you know, for my personality, I like to, uh, being, sorry, being selfish is one of the things that are, you know, on the spectrum of who I am would be, you know, kind of far away. I'm always willing to give my time, which is, which I do value a lot, give my time and my, and my energy for, for whatever uh, great cause there is. But um, when this, when this happened, um, I knew, uh, and, and, and having uh, mentors and people around me um, also provide their advice, you know, uh, I knew that I got I got to look to me now. It's not it's not about optics anymore and, and being oh Joe you're selfish you know what do you mean you can't hang out with us, et cetera et cetera. But but really having that permission and, and that confidence. It's one thing to hear it, but to really believe it. That um, and and sorry if, before I pass the mic mic off. Um, it's it's not only for me knowing that you're going to be selfish um, and accepting it, but feeling okay with it. You know, not having the, this thing, oh, I'm kind of being, I kind of feel bad. I, I should give him or her a call later, but really, you know, it doesn't serve any value. You know, don't call them back if it doesn't serve any value. You're here, you know, I mean, if you can use that time for, for, for the person that you're caring with or being with your family, then putting aside 30 minutes, an hour to speak to someone that just called you and really there, there, there's no value, you know, it, it's okay, don't call them back. You know, that, that's, that's how I've, I've come to terms with, with that. And, uh, that's what uh, I would like to see. I, I, I don't know if it's in the handbook or not. I apologize. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Debbie and I actually have a little bit of a hand in that caregiver handbook. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to see there, and maybe I, I, it would have helped me quite a bit, uh, is that, you know, I, I always wanted someone to tell me, you know, truthfully, you know, being a caregiver is really hard, right? Like, there is no easy answer, you know. It, it's going to feel like you're climbing a mountain all the time. It's hard, right? Don't fool yourself. It's very difficult to do. Uh, but you can do it, right? You'd be surprised at how much you can do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've never been much of a sugar-coating kind of a guy. And I think that if someone at some point had told me, it's, it is going to be hard. Like, don't fool yourself. It's going to be hard, but you'll be surprised at what will come out of it. And you'll be surprised at what you'll learn about yourself and what you'll learn about your family and what you'll learn about your friends, okay, and how they really are. Like, it really does bring the cream, you know, to the, crop, to the top of the, uh, 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 you know, of everything. Like, the, the cream rises, right? So... That's when you really learn who your friends are. That's really le when you learn who your family is. And for me, it would have just been nice to have somebody say, look, the road you're on now, it's a hard one. But be prepared for that, right? And you'll be surprised at what you'll learn uh, just about yourself. Okay. I would say uh, one of the things I would tell somebody if they're entering into a role of being a caregiver is learn the art of honesty and being honest with yourself and being honest with other people. And I think I learned that this one particular day, I can think of an example where I have a, a very old neighbor who lives across the road. I don't see her very often because, and this was during the winter, so in the winter, as we all know, elderly people don't get out as often, right? It's icy, snowy, what have you. So um, I was out shoveling or something, and she called me over from her front door. So um, she said, Janet, how are you? I've been hearing that things aren't so, so good at home. And I said, um, 
okay, yeah, it's okay. Everything's fine. You know, it's just we had this thing and I went into it and I said, but it's okay. She goes, Janet, it's shit. And I said, and I stood there. I'm sorry for the language, by the way, for the, uh, since it's being taped, but I mean, I can't dance around that, you know, and, and to me, she said, be honest, tell people it's not okay. And from that moment, I started doing that and I felt so much better. I felt better because then I thought, you know what, why am I telling people it's okay? It's not okay. It's not okay that this happened. It's not okay that this happened to us. What did we do wrong? And of course, we went through all that, right? But the fact that I was given the license to really say what was on my mind and in my heart changed everything for me. And if people couldn't absorb that, I'm sorry, but you know, that's life. It's not always great. It's not always happy, fun, whatever, you know, but if you're my friend or you're my, you know, support person, you're going to stand behind me and beside me and just be like, yeah, Janet, you know, you tell it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that was a turning point for me. And I think I would tell more people than I'm sure I have told other people that tell people, like if a girlfriend of mine was um, diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. So when I saw her and I learned the news, she was frail, very ill looking. And she said, oh, it's okay. And I go, Maxine, it's not okay. Don't tell people it's okay. And then she started doing that. And I think, you know, the more that we as caregivers tell other people that, you know, just tell it like it is, then other people will realize, yeah, you know what, it's true, right? So, and then learning to be a good advocate to your partner or whoever it is that you're supporting. Be there with them at appointments, ask questions, do your research before you head into those appointments. The doctors won't think that you're being, you know, overstepping them with their knowledge or what have you, especially if you um, frame it in a way that you're trying to make it a conversation, not just, you know, attacking them on whatever it is that they're telling you. I, I don't know, to me that was paramount as well. And the third thing I would only add is that um, through a side hustle that I have, Marie Provo knows about my website, and, and I, I channeled everything that we were going through into um, learning from other people how they found their resilience. And now I share that with others uh, through a website. And I think that, you know, from doing that and hoping that I'm helping other people and learning that you can be resilient, there are things that people go through on a day-to-day -day basis where you might think you're not strong enough, but there are other people out there in the world who probably thought they weren't strong enough either, and through whatever path that they took, they rose. Oh, sorry, yeah. Missed you. Hi, um, you all seem incredibly capable, and I was just wondering if in any way your capableness worked against you as a caregiver, because people would look at you and say, oh, they're handling this just fine. They're managing everything. There's no, we don't need to help them. Look at how well they're dealing with this. Um, did that work against you as well? Because you're all incredibly capable. You're all managing all of these things. Did people sort of look at you and say, yeah, they don't need me. Great question. Maybe, do we have room for one answer, do you think? Or one answer. Who would like to, who feels that they can handle that one? Joseph? <laughs> so the answer is yes. From my personal uh, opinion, I don't know if my fellow panelists will nod their head or what have you. But the, the one place where that comes top of mind, where it kind of worked against, uh, would be the... The checkups, you know, oh, we're not hearing, a, we're not receiving a phone call from so-and-so uh, anymore. And uh, actually, uh, a, a, a few months or after some time passed after the diagnosis, we actually did follow up with some of the family members just to make through co small conversation. And yeah, their answer was, well, I mean, you know, yeah, it looked like you had everything okay. What's the point of calling and saying hello if, uh, you know, if it's status quo? But, you know, as, as, as I'm sure we all can attest to, sometimes just getting a phone call and saying hello, even if it's quick or however it is, is, uh, is much appreciated. Well, thank you. 
you to our three panelists. You guys did a wonderful job and obviously are incredible caregivers. Uh, Rosemary Cashman is a nurse practitioner at BC Cancer in Vancouver. She's worked with brain tumor patients and families for over 20 years in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. And she serves on the board of directors for Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Uh, she's inspired and humbled by the courage, resilience, and creativity of patients and families that she's come to know. Uh, Rosemary's been a friend of our foundation for a very, very long time, and I'm so pleased that she's able to, uh, to lead the discussion today. So thank you. Hi everybody, welcome, and welcome to our panelists today. Lori Gallinger in the middle there, Natalie Russell on the end, and on the left there is Lorna Nietzsche. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'll just start and ask if anybody has any questions right off the top of their heads that they're burning to ask for of these panelists. Okay, and if not, um, I'll just turn to you guys and, and just ask you, you know, one of the things that I see in my role is um, that, you know, when patients come to our clinics, um, all attention is trained on the patient. And I also see families doing that as well. There's so much effort put into looking after the patient that sometimes the caregiver sort of gets lost in the shuffle. And I'm just wondering how it is that you sort of find time and the energy and the resources to look after your own needs. Does anybody feel like they want to tackle that? Okay. Um, I think with me, because my son was so young, he was two and a half years old when he was diagnosed, that I think the physicians and all the professional caregivers like the endocrinology, all the medical professions knew that they had to, they had to, you know, tell us what's going on and what our options were and what, what, what was available to us. So to some extent we may get overlooked, but I found with myself that I was even looking at the patient. So any care they give to the patient, I felt like they were taking care of us because we needed to know where to go with this. So I guess that would be my answer. <laughs> I guess I would mirror that answer to some extent um, because it's certainly in the very beginning, um, m my focus was 100%. Oh, Sorry, Rosemary. <laughs> my focus uh, was 100% on my husband. As some background, I'm a caregiver for my husband, James, who was diagnosed in 2013 with an oligodendroglioma, um, which was resected uh, approximately a month after diagnosis, uh, left him with an acquired brain injury. Um, so there was certainly a, a lengthy period of time, I would say that first entire year, um, there really wasn't, there honestly wasn't time um, because there's a lot of administrative things. There was um, his physical needs in terms of his care with radiation and chemo, but then there was also the acquired brain injury side which involved a lot of therapies and acquired brain injury program. Um, a lot of occupational therapy and then putting in other supports throughout that entire first year and and much as like Lorna has said um, my, I was a hundred percent focused on that um, and so I wasn't really even cognizant of what my needs were other than that I needed what I needed in that moment was to be a hundred percent devoting of my time to that and it really was after that first year when it was like oh wait so then I could say to myself you know what is it that I need then and and that has that's kind of evolved you you hit a new normal but new normal changes because with the ABI has also come a bit of a seizure disorder so there's steps forward and steps back so you know I'll, I'll leave it there and <laughs> let someone else
I neglected to ask you to introduce yourselves. <laughs> Didn't I? I apologize. I apologize. You did a very good job. <laughs> I apologize for that. But maybe I'll, I'll pass the mic on. I don't need the mic. I'm really loud. Uh, well, I'm told we need the mic anyway, actually. It, it's not so much for the, the room. It's for the video. Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. No, that's OK. Um, I'm Natalie. This is all still fairly new to us. My daughter was diagnosed about uh, 15 months ago at the age of 25. Um, within 13 days, we went from a headache to the diagnosis to the surgery um, to being sent home. So it was all, I called it fast and furious. Um, it's inoperable. Uh, it filled with fluid. So we technically don't know what type of tumor. But we do know her last two MRIs, it has shrunk. So they were able to remove 80% of the fluid, which caused a lot of the problems. Um, closed her left eye. She had a lot of numbness. She still has numbness and she still has vision problems. Um, but she's still here with me today. She's healthy, we're moving forward. And we're dealing with it, she's doing okay. Um, at the time, I didn't. I was. I just focused completely on her. Um, she was living on her own. She's a single mother. We had to move her back home. It was a vision problem. You don't. You don't know. The future is so unknown at that moment. And so, for us, it was the easiest thing to do. It was. It was hard for her to give up her independence, but at the time, it was the right decision to make. So we moved her back home. She's now back to living on her own. So things are going well that way. Um, I think I had a hard time even letting her go. You get so used to having them there, to knowing, knowing that they're okay on a daily basis and so that you can watch them. It's, it's just like letting your children grow and when they move, up, move out, it's the same thing when they get sick. Um, it's easier for me. It was easier to have her under my roof. Even though she was coming and going, whether it be to work, whether it be, you know, an outing with her daughter, if I knew she was coming home, then I, I knew. I knew everything was going okay. Um, I don't know, I'm rambling a little bit now, but yeah, I put myself on the back burner, but that's how I dealt with them. One foot in front of the other, one day at a time. If, if there is one thing you've learned or a few things you've learned through your experience as being a, uh, being a caregiver, is there something that you could recommend to someone else who's about to embark on this, this journey? Knowledge is I'll pass it on to you. Um, the best thing that happened to us was we found a support group. They have it once a month. It's for survivors and for caregivers. Um, that's the greatest thing that happened to us. Just to meet other people that have been through this, whether it was a caregiver or a survivor. My biggest fear was that she would have to have a second surgery. There's a woman in our support group that has had six craniotomies, and she was sitting there with me, so all was good. It made me feel better. It made me know that it was possible. <laughs> Um, I think for me, I think in society there's a lot of pressure to be able to handle all things at all times and I think it's very important for people to understand that to create space for themselves to, to feel what, what they want to feel, when they want to feel, how they want to feel it. Um, and for me, what that entailed at a, probably around the six month mark was, you know, about one afternoon a month, I would schedule time to just have a little mini breakdown and just sob for the afternoon. But because it's like you're dealing with all of these appointments and, and you can't, I'm going to swear, lose your crap in the middle of a meeting. You've got to hold it all in. Um, and so you go a whole month and you're holding it in and you're holding it in and you're holding it in. And what really helped me was giving myself permission and time and space 
just that once a month to just let it all out in an afternoon and kind of like hitting a reset button because it all builds up and you hit that reset button and then you can you can carry on and and help yourself stay present in the moments that you need to be present and that you need to be that advocate for your loved one um but you know it doesn't always you can't always schedule it and sometimes you just need to find other ways to and be accepting of those emotions especially if they're particularly negative you know not dwell on them but let them flow through you and move past it so you can move on to and be present for the key points that you need to be present for hi maybe i'll back up and explain a bit about my situation um my son was two and a half years old when he when um, we knew something was wrong we took him to emergency three times they did the the blood urine chest x-rays found nothing wrong hydrate him send him home so the third time in a month and a half we were at the hospital and it was Saturday night and the doctor on call basically I, I saw him out in the hallway and he said to me do you want to go home do you want to take your son home and I just looked at him and I go he's not eating he's not drinking he's you know how can I take him home well the next morning at 10 o'clock we were we did a CAT scan in the hospital 11 o'clock I got the results that he had a brain tumor craniofrangiomy which is on the hypothalamus the pituitary gland and the optic nerve and they were going to send him transport him by tra uh, ambulance to the the Stallery Hospital which is part of the University Hospital in Edmonton so at 12 o'clock we at the University Hospital at 1 o'clock he was in emergency surgery to remove the pressure from from inside the head he came out of the operating room he had a shunt to take the pressure off the off the head and 10 days later he was in the operating room again getting it resected so it happened very very quick for us and it was very it was quite a relief to finally be diagnosed with what is wrong so I guess because my son now is 20 years old he's graduated from high school he's in his third year of university and besides going to university he also runs an internet business he sells Pokemon cards and Pokemon codes online loves it very active he's lost a lot of his vision he's legally blind he's on replacement hormones for life so regular appointments uh, follow-ups um, every two weeks he goes for testosterone so it's it's quite it was it was quite a, a life-changing for us so I've made a list of things that I found was helpful or I found um, I found when we first got the diagnosis I had to take notes I had to write stuff down to remember it I walk out the door or I forget it and um, there were times when my husband and I both could go to um, appointments often we couldn't so there was there was just me there taking taking the notes taking it all in and um, so I I had to be very vigilant during these many uh, med medical appointments because right after the surgery we I think we were at the doctors like for the first week and then it graduated to two weeks and if you got to a month you were doing good right um, I would recommend developing a sport group um, so with us because he was so small we probably didn't have that to begin with but over the years we, through the different associations we've developed a support group with other families that have similar tumors with the similar um, side effects that we've we've referred to um, and if they're on medication I'd say 
I always keep a supply of medication around. I keep the expiry dates on the medication so I know how quickly, you know, what, what it is. And I was recently told, this is the first time, I've always heard horror stories of this, but it was about two weeks ago, we wanted to get a prescription refilled, and they said it's on pack order. It was the first time for me, but I've heard other families say that. I was quite surprised. And one thing I found with Jason is he was always quite a bit older than the age. And I, I probably didn't notice it until he was in preschool. And the, the assistant said to me that she enjoyed talking to Jason. And I thought, oh. She says, yeah, it's like talking to a 65-year-old man in a six-year-old body. And I'm going, wow. <laughs> so they do mature very quickly. And one other thing I have here is you think, why me? Why me? Why do I have to go through this? But you can certainly turn it around and say, why not me? I had a, a cousin that I always looked up to and admired. And um, when I was telling her my son's diagnosis, she basically just looked at me and said, the big guy upstairs knew you could handle it. <laughs> and I just go, oh, OK. <laughs> so. Thank you all. Any questions from the audience at all? OK, well, I have a question. You've talked a little bit about how you kind of negotiated the new, you, new normal for you. How have you found, um, what's your experience been with your friends and relatives? I, I hear from my patients sometimes that they're surprised about the people who are supportive of them and that they thought were not such good friends versus those that they thought were really good friends and who sort of didn't play a big role after the diagnosis. What has your experience been with your friends and families in terms of finding uh, an inner circle who could support you? I don't know if anybody would like to start there. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, I would put this on the list of things that I'm perhaps grateful for. Um, because I think in rough situations, it helps you clarify very quickly who those support people are and, and who they are not. And, and then you can, you know, life is too long and too short to, in my opinion, spend time who, with people who aren't going to be the level of support that you need. And, and situations like this can really help you kind of weed those people out pretty quickly and, and for that I'm, I'm grateful because then it can I can really work on those relationships that are strong ones with people who genuinely are going to give and receive the same level that I am so um, yeah this situation helped with that in, in some instances very quickly and in others um, I, I would say when it comes to family uh, every family has their own unique bit of crazy and so when it comes to dealing when it came to dealing with my family because I grew up with that crazy you know their their reactions were were normal to me there was nothing unexpected that's not to say that they weren't perhaps hard for other people but because I was used to my family it was easier and in dealing with my husband's family I feel like it did exacerbate some strain in relationships in those areas, some immediately and some, um, well, some immediately in areas I expected it. And, and then, you know, through the years, um, what you find as a primary caregiver, their lives all kind of return to nor normal and they really were at the five-year mark. Their day-to-day their -day life is not impacted and certainly um, my husband doesn't necessarily want them to see the reality of what he's dealing with every day and I I think that that has made the situation a little bit more difficult because they really have 
no realistic appreciation for what he's going through, and that's led them to have unrealistic expectations of him, of us as a couple, and and that has has led to some strains. And, you know, we just, we choose to spend our time with the people who are there for us, who we can go to and just be ourselves, um, and our relationships with with the people who continue to have unrealistic expectations are lessened, but in my opinion, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think, um, like I said, I'm grateful to now know that and devote the majority of my time to the people. Would they drop things for me? Yes, they would, and I would do the same for them. It's it's a genuine, you know, give and take relationship on equal footing and. And I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, I'm very lucky. Um, I have a lot of family around where I live. Um, we're very close, so they're all very supportive. Um, I think just more for my daughter, I think she struggles with things. She was very, um, she was very active in sports. Now, not so much. She's slowly slowly starting to get back into it, but it really bothers her. She had a lot of connections there. She had a lot of connections with the teams that she played for, and now she even struggles to go and watch the game. But she feels like she's left on the sideline. She gets a couple of quick hellos, but she does have a few close friends. And yes, you tend to find out very quickly who the good ones are, because they're the ones that stick around. They're the ones that call weekly. Doesn't always have to be daily, but no, very lucky. We have a lot of family. And I'm at the other end of the spectrum. My, my husband and I each have one sibling, so when we were going through it, basically his parents were in town. My parents were in the next province. My dad was dealing with prostate cancer. So it was Ed, my husband's Ed's family his mom and dad, they give us the support, and they supported us unwaverly. And I think because you come from a small family, you tend to want to be keep everything close to the chest, and you don't want to, you know, all the neighbors coming in, and, you know. So it was quiet for us, and we managed to get through it and, and adjust our life. So that, that's my story. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, Natalie, you talked about, and all of you have talked a little bit about the changes that occurred after the diagnosis with um, your loved one. Um, how, did you, how did you support them when they had that loss of independence and, you know, the changes in their abilities? I know your son was so, so little, but um, how have you found that experience and what have you done to sort of get through that period? I found, with the, I found with my daughter, um, because she lost her independence, um, she was quite upset over that. Um, to living back at home, you know, she, w she was struggling with dealing with that. All I did was talk to her on a daily basis. It's not always going to be like this. Um, don't get frustrated. Um, it pushed, uh, the tumor is in her uh, cavernous sinus and it swelled and pushed on her optic nerves, which closed her eye completely. It was closed for about a month. Then it slowly started to flicker. Um, now it's open about 90%. She still has double vision. Um, not as bad as what it was. Still only 15 months. We're still hoping maybe she'll recover full eyesight in the eye. But she hasn't gone blind in the left eye, so all is well. Um, but I kept telling her, she kept getting frustrated. And I just said, it's not always going to be like this. You are going to heal. You have to remember. You have to give it every day. Every, every day is a new day. Every day that you get up, we're going to do something better. If something better is going to happen to you, the pain will be a little less. You'll be able to do a little more. Um, and that's, that's I, I said, you will not always live with me. You, you, keep, you keep moving forward. You will eventually be back out on your own. It's just hard for them to see it at that moment, because at that moment, it's just everything. 
and we can all look around and we can look beyond for them it's, it's they struggle uh, I just talk to her constantly um, I think for me it was it was within that first year it really did evolve drastically um, James was diagnosed May 31st of 13 surgery July 5th um, and we were wildly unprepared because we'd been told going into this surgery you know he had a 3% chance of a little bit of memory loss he'd be home in a few days and and all would be well and they got in there the tumor was in his frontal lobe so they essentially took his left frontal lobe um, which is where all of your executive function happens and he was in the hospital for five weeks and so for me and in that very beginning he didn't know where he was in time he didn't know where he was location he didn't always recognize me um, so uh, care for him evolved from a hundred percent we'd be in a room and he didn't even know we were talking about him um, and that was for a, the first two to three months um, conversations were happening and and he didn't know that they were about him um, so it went from it was a hundred percent I should say he was 43 at the time so growing man he all he ever wanted to do in life was work um, and at about the two-week resection mark uh, doctors went from oh he'll be home in three days to he'll never work and he may not ever be able to come home um, so first few months it was a hundred percent he's sitting next to me just kind of staring into space and I'm making all of these decisions I would say that that was probably the hardest time period for me because I felt like he didn't get to make an informed choice going into the surgery and and now the person who should be making all of these decisions not that I couldn't um, but I the conversation I wanted to have most was with him um, I was confident at all times that I was making the right decision for him but what I wanted was for him to be able to make that choice for himself and he couldn't um, and then it evolved to he eventually knew that we were talking about him um, and so that I think was really as he progressed it was hard for me and I try both trying to you know kind of let him take back that independence and control and an engagement and try not to correct him when he got misinformation too much when he was giving uh, information to doctors and and so it's it's kind of been me you know doing everything from the beginning and, and learning to let go um, through those years and that's been that's been kind of hard because in the very beginning um, you know he didn't know where he was he might run out of the house he might he can't drive anymore um, he didn't like driving a lot before so that hasn't been the biggest thing uh, he does get really down now about not working and and we talk a, like um, now that we we talk a lot about that what that could look like for him um, because he also sees me working sometimes two jobs um, so he gets very very down about that because work was exceedingly important to him um, and so it's me reassuring him about what he is bringing to the household um, how he is contributing how he is helping um, but it's a lot of conversation in in both acknowledging what he's lost because it's there it's present to not acknowledge it would be a disservice to him um, and also helping redirect his focus on to what he can do what he is doing um, where he is adding value so that um, he knows it's not a total loss that it's a loss of of the one thing that he found important but that it doesn't mean it's a total loss there are other things that that he can now you know take ownership of in in being bringing to the table what he'd like to bring Jason was two and a half and of course one of the meetings with the neosurgeon he told us that Jason would never drive and of course you go oh wow 
and you think, how is, how is this going to work? Because, well, 20 years ago, that was our major transportation, right? And then, very after he gave me time to absorb that, the next statement was, but you never know, there might be self-driving cars by the time he's. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for Google Car to take my job away. <laughs> We were, I guess, having the tumor at a very young age, at two and a half. Jason was able to, kids are very resilient, and he, he um, quickly jumped back from it. We were able to, you know, take his hand, get his balance, teach him how to walk again. So I, I feel that at two and a half, he quickly rebounded from the, the, the tumor. And for us, it was it was a God's, you know, it was so nice to know what was wrong with him and go forward from there. Thanks. I'll just ask if there are any questions. I don't want to leave anybody out. If you have something you want to ask, Tracy. Um, our, a caregiver handbook, um, and so I would I would be really interested in asking each of the panelists, sort of if there was you know one or two things that you would really want to see in a caregiver handbook, what would it be? What you know either resources or strategies or you know topics that would be of importance to you to make sure that you're sharing sort of with other uh, other caregivers. One thing that I always felt was difficult is knowing where the resources are. Um, where do you go, who has what, and how do you access those? It, the, the professionals did a very good, the healthcare professionals did a very good job while we were in the hospital, but obviously this wasn't a, a month thing. So, you know, after that, he was two and a half, and then, of course, once he got school age, we had to learn all how to navigate the school system, how to ask for accommodations without being seen demanding. And, and of course, what, what accommodations does he need, how, and that kind of thing. Um, I'll let you, and if I think of anything else. Um, I actually have to say the same thing. My daughter was greatly taken care of in the hospital, uh, right down to the porters. Everybody was fantastic in dealing with her, in dealing with us. Um, the day she was released, it's like, here's your prescription, here's the door, all the best. And you kind of get home and you just kind of sit there and go, wow. You know, how do you, how do you look after yourself now mentally? It's the support group. Um, lucky enough, I just, I happened to Google it and I happened to find one. We missed the first one, the first meeting. We went to the second one, and I don't know where we would be right now. Half the group is here. So I didn't come to this conference last year. My daughter did, and she came with them. So they came as a group. Um, I've made friends. She's made friends. It's, it gave me hope, and that's what it did for me. But. What if somebody didn't have the internet? What if somebody doesn't have the resources to find it? If they could just say, maybe when you're getting released, here's a pamphlet. Here are some things that you can, you can do if you want to. You don't have to, but here's what's out there for you. Um, as Tracy said, I'm one of the people working with the Brain Tumor Foundation on this particular resource, so we've hashed out a lot. Um, but I think one of the things that can be helpful is, um, and it kind of goes with what these two ladies have said, is how do you organize yourself administratively? Because when you're taking care of a loved one, it is its own administrative job in terms of the funding supports, the occupation, the various therapies, whether they be on the cancer side of the equation or the acquired brain injury or 
perhaps they've been left with uh, a physical injury other than uh, a brain uh, injury. Um, there are so many supports and so many care providers that are now involved in your life. And, you know, other people who have been through this might have learned some tricks and tips and tools along the way to collate that and and make it more efficient and streamlined. And, and I think for many, when you become a primary caregiver, you might also be working at the same time. So you're working your full-time job all day. Then you have the, the physical care needs of your loved one, the emotional care needs, and you have this you know part-time administrative job that is organizing all of the people that are now part of your loved one's life and managing all of those appointments and facilities that are available to you. So, so not just what is the information and where is it, but what are some key strategies or ways to manage the flow of all of those appointments and all of those people in, in a way that um, will kind of help with the burden of that so that you can focus on the important things which are not only taking care of your loved one, but enjoying them. Well, maybe if I could add one more thing. Um, seeing Jason was two and a half, went through his childhood, became a teenager, and then he hit 19. And you realize the pediatrician is a pediatrician. Now what? And luckily, his pediatrician has taken him in and wrapped his arms around him. <laughs> But for endocrinology, we had to move on to a new doctor, and of course that was new, you know, finding a new person, new prescription. He was on the human growth hormone, which is covered by the Alberta government until he's 19 years old. So I wasn't ready, I didn't, I didn't research that one enough ahead. So I was kind of scrambling at the end, but I was luckily, being a mom, I had a stockpile downstairs in the fridge. So we made it through. <laughs> but, you know, once they turn 19, then what? So, and I'm finding that Jason probably, I don't think he has, has the support group he could use. I went to the adult support group in Edmonton with the thinking that if I thought this would be useful for him, I would take him the next meeting. And I, I ended up not going, I'm sorry, <laughs> because I, I think for him it would be too depressing, simply because, you know, you have people in all spectrums. And it might have been just the one meeting I went to, but I'm finding as a 20-year-old, he's navigating the, the university situation, and that's, you got to, you know, just got to find out what you can find out and hopefully you go the right way. Thank you all. Those are great answers. Yes, please. So Tracy, I'm pleased that you're writing this pamphlet and you're helping. Um, could you put uh, an extra few pages in at the end around uh, tips to to people when their role as caregiver is over. Because when you're a caregiver, like, and I know exactly what you're all saying, you're busy, and this whole organization. But when your role is over, you've lost your job. And everybody's looking at you thinking, oh, you've lost your wife and you know, your partner and all that stuff. Yes, all of that's true. Though, you've, you know, in our case, we had a five-year lead up. So, <clears throat> but you've actually lost your purpose. And, and, you know, where you were always seen as two people, Brian and X, now you're just Brian. Um, so that, I think, would be an important addition to, to your book. Brian, um, do you Time. It was eight years ago uh, that my wife died. She was diagnosed with glioblastoma given 14 months and lived 68 months. So, and broke all kinds of records, so that was great. And when, while she was feeling well, we lived like hell. 
Uh, we, we, we partied, we'd entertained, we traveled extensively because we knew. We didn't talk about it, but we knew. So um, w when she did die, it was like, how come the house is so empty? Not that she was so noisy. Um, and like she walked around going, well, what do I do now? And that period went on for a long time until you, you started finding out who you were again as a single as a single person after a long time. So it's, it's finding a new job, uh, starting to recognize that you have value again, that you had, you know, you've got more value than just caring for someone else. And it's just finding self again. Yeah. Yeah. I think you bring up a really great point and something I hadn't necessarily thought of before as well, but even for somebody who's sort of been in that caregiving role for a very long time, and maybe the person's doing well again. And so you transition sort of out of that caregiver role and trying to go back into maybe a spouse role. And that transition is kind of redefining what that relationship is again. So whether you've actually lost the person or they've passed on or whether you're just transitioning back into a different place and space in your relationship, I think you bring up, you, you made a really, really great point. That's something that we can definitely focus on. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Agree. That's a great, a great point. Thank you. Uh, I, I was just wondering if we could get back to something that Lori mentioned that is very common in my life and on the other side of, of all this, which is that, you know, when you have this diagnosis, it's so life-changing. Often patients are very eager to get back to normal and sometimes don't have the insight to appreciate that they're really different. And I've just, I was just wondering, like you spoke a lot about how your husband was different and sometimes cognitively wasn't able to appreciate that he couldn't do the things he had before. How did you, what was your experience and how did you manage to support and, I mean, you talked about just sort of giving him sort of, um, um, emphasizing the role that he still did have, but were there other things that were helpful to you? And, um, and that's a question sort of for all of you, because I'm sure that you've all experienced that to some extent. Uh, perhaps this is the gift of the short-term memory <laughs> deficit. <laughs> I'll say, uh, <laughs> because he will have that down day or down moment and we'll have the conversation and then he'll forget. <laughs> So, so I think that that's a little bit of a gift, but very often if, I mean, and I think, that I, so I'll say, with acquired brain injury, uh, one of the things that people can often do is uh, confabulate, which for those of you who don't know what confabulate is, um, that is when, um, say if you ask my husband a question, he will give you an answer. and. It's probably not the correct one. And it's not that he's lying, it's that his brain is trying to piece together and give you an answer based on past experience and what have you. Um, so in moments when he's saying, oh, I'm gonna do this, and gonna do that, when he confabulates, my rule is, uh, has become that I do not correct him if, it's not, say, life or death or impactful in any way, shape, or form, because in all honesty, he tells some of the most beautiful stories. His brain, <laughs> his brain comes up with some of the most beautiful answers that make me laugh, that bring me joy, that do so much, that aren't going to do any harm to anyone in any way, shape, or form. So I kind of apply that rule to that situation as, as well. When James is oh, I'm going to get back to work, or I can drive again, or I can do all of those things. It's an assessment within myself to say, it, am I going to cause more harm if I push him and tell him no, or, you know, he's feeling very positive right now, which has so many emotional and physical benefits. You know, if I just, you know, to let him continue to think that, and, and who knows, maybe that is the way that he will get there. It doesn't matter that it's not reality right now. 
if maintaining that positivity and, and encouraging him in that, whether it's realistic or not, you know, what is the harm in that? Um, it's not like he's running out to get a job tomorrow if I say, yes, he's not. He, he just is so positive, and I'm actually exceedingly lucky. My husband is exceptional and positive and just wonderful. Um, so the way that I deal with that is I let him be that positive person who says all of those things and, you know, whether he gets there or not doesn't matter. It's his attitude about it that is really what's affecting change in our day-to-day -day lives and making it more positive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> One thing um, the doctor did tell us when Jason was two and a half is that it could definitely affect his mood. And of course, when Jason was a baby, he was a very content baby, hardly ever cried. He was easy to look after. And, you know, it kind of put me back a bit, wondering what I was heading for. But I'll, I'll tell you now that if he gets tired and he's had a tough day, yes, he will flare out at you. <laughs> but I know where it's coming from, so that's okay. Thank you all very much. I think we're just about out of time here. Tracy, is that right? We are. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our panelists so much, Valerie, Lori, and Lorna, for your wisdom and for sharing it with the group.